So uh, I'm just going to uh, run through a very brief introduction of the Canary Project generally and focus uh, more on one project that we um, produced or sponsored or facilitated uh, called the High Waterline Project as it fits with this uh, theme of rising sea level. Um, so uh, as I mentioned last night, in 2006 I founded an organization called the Canary Project, um, which has this mission uh, of uh, creating or producing art and media that deepen public understanding of climate change. Um, and um, we founded the project originally as a photography project. And our initial goal was simply really actually to create an analog, uh, a visual analog of what Betsy was doing. Betsy was going around the world and writing about places where climate change was actually happening, interviewing scientists and making it apparent to Readership that's, that climate change was real, um, it was urgent, it was now, and there was this great discrepancy between scientific understanding and public and understanding and political will. Um, so we, we did the same thing. We went around the world um, and, and talked to scientists and then photographed rather than writing stories. Um, and uh, our initial um, idea was that we were creating, we're going to create evidence. And, and I think a lot of people get involved in this space. Um, I was convinced initially that, oh, we'll just rationally uh, present this situation, argument to people, and the culture will eventually change and catch up. And that has proven to be just like totally incorrect. Um, uh, so, um, and I don't even think the photographs function as evidence. That's sort of the technical um, discussion that we have later. Um, but this, 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 it would be very apparent. Uh, photographs are very useful in, in one way, in, in that um, in that everyone speaks the language of photographs. Everyone knows what to do with a photograph. Um, but it became very apparent to us we didn't just want to uh, cordon the photographs off in some gallery space. So we um, started very early to collaborate with other people to position the photographs in different spaces, like science museums or public spaces, um, as well as art museums and galleries and so on. Um, and this, this collaborative process um, opened us up to the idea that um, we could facilitate as a collective, I suppose, or as an organization, we vacillate on, on how we describe ourselves, uh, various projects. And that we could perform different functions for different projects, fundraising, publicizing, organizing, uh, giving a volunteer base, et cetera. And, and that's when we really launched the Canary Project at large and began sponsoring a variety of projects. So this is um, uh, from our website, and it's explaining uh, the kind of different areas that we think of our projects fall in. Um, and, and they fall uh, broadly into to field studies or artist research, installation and interventions, public messaging and campaigns, uh, participatory or place-based projects, and education or student projects. And um, behind this kind of categorization um, comes a sensibility that I was alluding to last night, and I, uh, I'm going to mostly just show the, the nuts and bolts of, of Eve's project, but just at the top, want to, to, to once again reintroduce this idea that, that in however we think about this question of climate change and creating change, as Jane said, I think that's really what's underwriting all of our impulses for creating change. However we think about our professional lives with this, that I really do feel it's important to recognize that the activist impulse is primary. So it's not about creating a debate or an economy for me between art and activism, um, but it's more about realizing that we need to make a change. That's an activist discourse. That's an activist disposition by definition. Uh, there's something that's wrong and we need to change it. And the reason I think that's important is because then that allows you to start thinking very strategically and concretely about what's effective. Um, and I think that for me, the value I get out of conferences like this for my own discipline is to fine tune my sense of strategy, like what's effective. I want to be as concrete as possible, because we just don't have a lot of time. Um, so, um, so these are the various modes of artistic production that we think of as effective. And different projects do different types of work. Um, so this is the, the I just took quickly a couple uh, images from other projects to get the ease. Um, but uh, this is a photography project it's called The History of the Future. Um, and as I said, it, it consists of photographs, um, quite, you know, some 100 or so photographs of, of places, 14 locations throughout the world um, that are showing impacts of climate change. And, and, and 
our method in, in taking these photographs is to first work with generalists, scientists, that, or journalists like Betsy, um, to identify locations, then work with local scientists to understand what's happening in the landscape and in the photograph. We literally follow the pointing finger of those scientists, which is um, another thing to discuss. But then we, then we, um, we, like I said, we position the photographs in different ways. So it, the, the, the modes of the photographs range from contemplative type environments like this one, um, where we're, we're, we're curating objects um, from a local, from a university, uh, various lessons in a university, and putting them in conversation with the photographs. Um, and this is not doing something very direct. It's doing something more, um, it's something different. It's, it's, it's trying to deepen people's sense of time, really, which I think is one of the fundamental change of consciousness that we need to undergo is to understand how human beings are situated within geologic time. Um, or we position them in very direct activist positions, like this bus ad campaign that we did at the museum of the Art in Denver. Um, another project is being featured with posters, and again, this is very directly activist. Um, so we, the basic idea behind the project was solicit designers to um, make posters um, that, that activate one of these five emotions that I brought up last night that Marshall Gantz feels are essential to social movements. Anger, urgency, hope, solidarity, feeling you can make a difference. And not necessarily to feel pressure you all at once. Um, uh, so, and we do different things like workshops with kids in this project. So it's not just about design, it's about connecting design to real um, uh, activist energies. Um, but this is E's project. Um, and uh, so Eve, Eve Mosier uh, came to us in 2007 and said she had this idea for a project to draw a chalk line around 70 miles of coast in Brooklyn and Manhattan um, that would articulate to a broad public the combined effects of sea level rise and increased frequencies of storms on flooding in the city. And Eve had the project all set, she had a budget for it, she had a method for doing it, and she came to us really uh, for help in facilitating it and making sure it got out to a broad public. So our role was as really a support role for Eve. Um, and uh, so one of our roles was interfacing with the city government, which is a whole interesting and long story. Um, one of the productive things we did get out of the, the city government was one of these slosh maps, which you'll probably see more of. Um, uh, and it, it, Eve essentially is drawing um, a, a line. It's not. It's not a direct correlation, but essentially where the, where the red is. Um, so she's moving along the city um, with her little cart here, which is like the same thing you find sports fields with, um, and, and, and showing where uh, 10 feet above sea level uh, is. Um, and the significance of that uh, definite geographical landmark is that that is traditionally where the 100 year flood line is. Um, let me just get the head up back. Um, but in, in articulating uh, what the, this project's significance was, particularly to the press, um, we follow the lead of this seminal paper uh, on climate change impacts in New York. So this is really a job of, of translating science, and that's how we conceived of it. So this paper said, among other things, um, that, that that 100 year flood event um, that was happening at the 10 feet above sea level uh, mark was going to happen much more frequently in 100 years as time progresses because of climate change. So I, I'm going to misquote the exact statistics, but it's something like by 2050, um, it's going to be every 52 years, and by 2080, it's going to be every 12 years, and by the time it's going to be like every five years, essentially you're just going to be dealing with flood planning at that point. And that, had, that has enormous implications on a city the size of New York, obviously, um, particularly um, when you're talking about a, a city that is actively constructing a development plan. And reading the same papers, by the way, these, these scientists, uh, Vivian Gornitz and uh, Cynthia Rosenzweig, et cetera, um, were the same people advising the city on their plan in 2030, that um, So I'm going to go back, but before that, so, so essentially we're translating that scientific paper, one section of what we're doing here, into the New York Times. This is the front page of the New York Times art section. And that's one of the impacts of the project, is that it takes this paper and translates it um, to, a, to a broader public and a broader readership. Um, but it's important that that's just one, the, the, the documentation and the media coverage of the project is one part of it. Um, the other part, um, and perhaps equally important, um, is, is the direct 
engagement that Eve is having with people on the street as she's drawing the line. So it's it's you know it's a curious thing to see this woman and she's got a bunch of photographers and video people following her um, around, but we want to know what's happening. And so Eve will talk dialogue with people and explain it using maps and so on. Um, and the other thing that she'll do, she did, is hand out um, action packets, right? So anger, hope, fear, urgency, you know, solidarity, urgency, whatever those things are. The project at its core is really about urgency, potentially anger, um, um, but, but it has this other escape route into hope and solidarity and feeling you can make a difference um, because she's telling people what they can do to contribute to a better future, a future where it's not going to necessarily be flooded. Um, and so she handed out these action packets to people as she went and also, and also had these same uh, kind of talking points or whatever on her website. Um, and this was part of our role as well. The Mary was helping to edit these things um, um, as well as helping to um, convene our scientific advisory board and making sure um, that the talking points were tight. And that was actually a very interesting process because the scientists we spoke with, which were mostly at Goddard Institute, um, I have one last one. Um, were, uh, um, were not, like the city, were not willing to publicly align themselves with the project. Um, so it was, a, it was a behind the scenes negotiation about the talking points. So we sent memos about what we thought the project, or what the line meant uh, to, the, to the scientists at Goddard, and they line edited them back and sent them back to us to make sure our language was responsible. Um, but that wasn't a public endorsement, but that was a collaboration of sorts. And, I think that there's something in that, potentially. I mean, there's something to be said for direct collaboration, but there's also something for people keeping within their disciplines. Um, I guess I'll end there.